I wanted to I wanted to show you something before we start with the questions, right? I'm going to just get my camera and okay, you see all those boxes over there, and then I have a box of tools over there, and there's I don't have a garage, okay, like mm -hmm. usually have in the United States, but I do have I do have um, um, uh, shelves and floors and cupboards. Full of electronic stuff and all of that is your fault what don't blame me <laughs> <laughs> because i started watching your your youtube video back in the day you know and and i i had i had always been uh, this is a, a confession i have to make i've always been a bit of a klutz right and so uh, a bit of a uh, a clumsy person but you know, you saw, I saw you figuring stuff out, and I said, mm -hmm. oh, maybe, you know, and it turns out that you can, nowadays, you can just buy stuff, chips from a Chinese manufacturer, it takes three months to arrive, but you can mm -hmm. buy them, right, for a few cents, and then a breadboard, and plug some, some cables in, and, oh my god, it works as the spec says, and you can do stuff with it, and then, like, <laughs> how, how is this even possible? You know, Isn't it great? I, yes, it is. So, it, is, it is great to live in this type of time. So my, quest, my first question to you is, how do you feel about being an, an actual, I, I hate this word, but I think, it, I think it's the best one, an actual influencer? You know, I never expected or wanted to be an influencer. Uh, I, uh, it goes... It goes clear back to my race car days. Um, I became maybe a small time influencer around the race tracks that I was at. And it was kind of a, at that time, it was a bit of a strategic advantage in my racing to have, you know, engage with fans and learn how to speak with them and be cordial. And um, I think that's where I first kind of picked up the skills of being an influencer. But this is like 1990 two or something like that it's like you know pre-internet days it was like bulletin board days um so you know i had no clue what was coming for me you know a, a decade or two later um then all of a sudden i did a product uh the commodore 64 all-in-one joystick that had all these video yeah. games in it and it was this huge viral hit uh people loved it um and then John Markoff, he's a reporter at New York Times, contacted me. He's like, I want to do just a, you know, probably a little blurb, you know, as a side column in the in our newspaper. And he, I talked to him for just a few minutes on the phone. And he's like, you know, can we just put a comma in this? And can I just like drive out to see you? So he flew into the Portland area and then drew, drove way out into the, the woods where I was living at the time and and spent a couple hours with me and this so, was all our oh go ahead he came all the way from new york is that it he came from new he flew from new york or, or to no york? i think he was uh, based in um san francisco but oh, it's still that's uh that's a uh it's two hours he rented a car i didn't live right in portland so he had to probably drive another 45 minutes to reach yeah. me and so i mean this is like the first like big wig reporter I'd ever talked to and I didn't think too much of it because he'd framed it originally as maybe just a little blurb in the this inside page somewhere and so I was traveling for work and I get on a plane and I look over and the gentleman sitting next to me this is a few days later um, has a newspaper and there's this huge like picture of me and this story called a toy with a story and yeah. it was like this big two page spread and I'm just like, oh my goodness, wow. And uh, this is around 2004, I guess. And uh, I don't think anyone really knew what an influencer was back then either. But at that time, people wanted to contact me so badly, but I was traveling. They uh, didn't know how to reach me because I didn't have much of a online presence. And then they were calling my dad. My dad was getting panicked. So mm -hmm. By the time I got home after this business trip, I, uh, uh, my answer machine was full from my father's messages of like, I don't know, people are calling for you. I'm, I'm, is everything okay? 
And there's yeah. another one. It's like, you know, I, I stopped, you know, one of these people and asked him what was going on. And apparently there's some kind of news report about you. I'm going to go buy the newspaper. And then another phone call. He's like, oh, my God, kiddo, this story is amazing. Whatever. But that was, I mean, this a long story. But um, that was kind of my first taste of, like, my five minutes of fame uh, kind of thing. And it freaked me out. Um, it, it literally freaked me out because people were... What what did people want? They just wanted to talk to me. There was business opportunities. Oh. There was people like, please marry me. You know, it was a, a wide range of like, you know, I know most of it was tongue in cheek, but it was a little freaky for me. I'm, I don't know, I'm maybe in my mid 20s at this point, or, you know, maybe not even 30 yet. So I didn't know how to actually handle all of that. And I retracted for quite a few years, um, kind of publicly. Um, after that, just because I was just a little weirded out by all of this um, attention. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd go to various events and people would be like, hey, I love this product that you built. And I'd continue to build products. And I started to get more comfortable with people coming up to me and talk to me about the products and things like that. And, uh, and then I, I kind of got over this kind of fear of strangers approaching me in various ways. And uh, then I, I started a YouTube channel when it was super early. Um, YouTube was a brand new thing. I'd started a job in a company called New Tech. Um, so they did the video toaster originally for the Commodore Amiga. It was kind of a dream job for me to go work with them. Yeah, so the video toaster back in the 80s and 90s was this amazing device. It had a, a bunch of clever tricks in it that could do video editing on an Amiga. and this company became quite big um, in the 90s. And so in the uh, 2000s, I had an opportunity to go work um, with them on a follow-on product. Now it's a PC-based system. Mm -hmm. And I was working on what was called the TriCaster. And, and so I'm working at this company, and it's quite a thrill. And basically what this box did was it was this integrated PC with special cards in it. And then all you had to do is just plug the thing into the internet and you could do live streaming. And live streaming was like a really new thing at the time. So I decided to learn about this live streaming thing. And so uh, I'd run into a gentleman, his name was uh, George Sanger. Um, he's famous in the video game space. He's called the Fat Man. He's a, a video game mus musician. Yeah, rings a bell, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Shoot, now I'm embarrassed. I can't remember the game that put him on the map. But um, he's like, hey, let's do a streaming thing. Um, um, I'll be the fat man. You be the circuit girl. We'll do like a weekly. Like, I, I saw that series. Yes. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, so we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Um, you know, he's in Texas. I'm in Portland. I'm commuting back and forth to Texas and stuff. And so we're trying to figure out this video streaming thing. And I'm doing it kind of for work to, to learn about, you know, what the heck the product I'm working on is. And I was actually just kind of beta testing all of my hardware live. And so there were these services like Justin TV and Ustream. And so I just set up in my hardware lab this box so that it streamed video 24 hours a day. And I had all these cameras set up in the, uh, the work area. And uh, every Sunday, we would stream a live show where um, we would explain some science topic. And I really liked it because I felt like I was really starting to give back. Because ever since I've been a kid, I've had mentors that have helped me mm -hmm. do everything I've done. I've never gone to college for engineering. I'm a high school dropout. But it was out of the goodness of mentors' hearts, they taught me how to do electronics and optics and mechanical engineering stuff like that so as like this is like a way i can give back and people seem to like it and this community started forming around this fat man and circuit girl um live stream thing and we got more and more advanced on this live stream we had text chat um going an irc channel then we added text to speech and then i we added features where they could control the TriCaster or they could move pan, tilt, zoom cameras. And it was, it was quite an experience for like a year or two when I did this, having a few hundred folks on the internet kind of as my companions anytime I was in the workshop.
it was interesting. I'd be like, I'd be working on a project and be like, oh, I just don't know the pin out of this particular part. I can't find it. And then you'd have like 50 people kind of hanging out with you and instantly they'd start typing and searching. And then all of a sudden an answer would just pop up out of text to speech. And I'd be like, oh, gee, thanks. That's amazing. Um, Talking, yeah, uh, you, you, uh, we, you you mentioned a lot your your mentors and you mentioned it uh, a lot in your keynote your keynote is, is was basically structured on all the mentors you had um i could not help noticing that there were not any women in in that list though yeah you know it's pretty sparse um that's not really the case on the business side um in particular now i have a, quite a few women that i um speak with and and um talk with but definitely in the early days you know the tech industry is overwhelmingly male dominated so you know it was mostly men and that comes with ups and downs um you know there's things i don't talk about very often but you know i've put myself in harm's way you know thinking someone was a mentor and they ended up being kind of a creeper um so you you know i think if you know folks that are out looking for mentors you know, especially if you're young and maybe a bit naive, like I was in my 20s, you have to be a little careful. Nothing bad happened. I was able to get out of all these bad situations, but um, it is a hazard, you know, being female engineer or female race car designer, you know, and and trying to, you know, carve a place in this pretty male dominated, you know, area. So, so when you were a race driver, it was also uh, very male dominated. Uh, I, I assume, right? Yeah, very much so. Okay. So, I was. <laughs> you really yeah. like the challenge to me. <laughs> well, you know, but, I'm not. I'm not your atypical. I mean, not your typical person. Um, I I like thrills. I'm I'm very adrenaline junkie, and even down to my like. What I choose to do for engineering, I don't choose the easy thing. I, mm -hmm. I choose the thing that's really difficult. Um, I'm sorry, am I going to make this a little long? But I just want to share something that um, one of my mentors, unfortunately, is a male mentor, but he 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 told me like how to choose projects. Yeah. He he's like, there's three projects you can choose. There's there's something that's easy. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can do it. Those are uninteresting projects for folks like you know, us, right? Anyone can do it. We're not going to put our heart into it because it's easy. There's impossible projects, right? You know in your heart it's impossible, so you're not going to put your full energy into it. And the projects you should look for are the um, projects where they're freaking hard. You have to thread a couple needles perfectly to achieve it, but if you do execute perfectly and it's going to be really hard, those are the satisfying um, projects and so somehow in my life that's I just gravitated and figured that on out on my own before being told to look for those type of projects but um, I always look for projects that are on the edge of being impossible but if you squint real hard you can believe that they could happen yeah so I guess what I mean how can we solve this, this really uh, obvious imbalance uh, uh, okay <clears throat> that, that is an enormous question i uh, <laughs> maybe it's unfair but but maybe you have some sort of insights in, into into what can be done that or, is or, a great great question um let me think about that for just a oh. split second here i mean maybe i'll just relate some of the things that sadden me about say the computer industry yeah. You know, recently I watched um, the documentary on the computers, the women that did all the computing for um, NASA and space and aircraft. You know, many of the original, you know, folks in computer science were women and they got edged out. And, you know, I've kind of felt that in my career too. There's, there's like these situations where uh, women tend to get edged out and it's, probably by the, the way that <clears throat> women interact versus the way men interact. I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of studies out there that show that, you know, women typically don't ask for raises. They don't ask for promotions. 
um, which is really unfortunate, um, where men, even if they don't deserve it sometimes, they'll just like, I demand a promotion and they can just work their way up the ladder and become, you know, more, um, more successful than, you know, say an average, average woman, because they just don't ask for it as much. Um, and I've taken that to heart and, and just talking about these business um, mentors, the women business mentors have taught me that and like point me to articles often and like, you know, you need to fight this urge. You need to ask for what you want. You need to go in bravely and boldly. Um, so I think that's a bit of a challenge. I, I think I've, it's just really sad to see like um, women get shoved to the side. It just happened to me recently, my previous startup. Oh. You know, I, I, I suffer from uh, uh, this kind of imposter syndrome. Yeah. Uh, uh, where you, yeah. I, I think I, every, it's very familiar, I guess. <laughs> I think everyone suffers from imposter syndrome because, you know, to get ahead in life, you have to do a lot of things you've never done before. So you have yeah. to, you kind of internally feel like, you know, I'm, I'm bullshitting my way through this like tough challenge, but that's engineering. Like, yeah. again, like the interesting problems have never been solved it's before. Like, like you're bullshitting your way and suddenly it works as, oh, it works. I'm not shit after all. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think that's so funny. Like people always approach me and like, they'll point to some project I worked on and like, you must be a genius. And like, you must have just had this clairvoyance ahead of time that just everything was going to like, you know, this technology was going to fall in place. And it's like the true answer is, hell no. Like, I had no clue what pieces were going to go into that thing. I just had to figure it out as as I went. And I think that's a big advantage I have is I've always it starts from when I was a kid living pretty much by myself on a farm. My father had to work during the day. I spent a lot of time by myself on the family farm um, and I was into electronics. And so back then you couldn't get good information. So it was a lot of like trial and error and experimenting. And pretty soon you get this intuitive feel of how engineering is supposed to work right. and and that served me really well served me really well later in my career not so much in the early days mm -hmm. um a, a quick interesting story early days of engineering i was like cutting my teeth and becoming more and more successful i would go into these meetings you know predominantly uh, male and we'd be talking about a problem and I would use different language than they would. I would say, I feel that we can solve that this way. And I, I was always baffled when I would use words like feel, that there would be this backlash. You know, it's like, you know, we're not going by your gut intuition or we're not going by your emotions. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a societal thing that's really sad. It's like women are portrayed as emotional beings and we all use our intuition of course. to figure out engineering problems. And it is a feeling that you have, it's a pattern match. Like mm -hmm. you've seen this pattern a thousand times and you feel that it follows a pattern. And mm -hmm. um, so I think I learned some forbidden words to use around you know, men and engineering and like try to keep it away from emotional words and, and be mm -hmm. more definitive even though probably the meetings and these discussions would have been better served if we could have just laid it out on the table and say like, this is just an, a hunch. I think it's a hunch because it pattern matches and we should explore it. You know, that's. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, okay. I, I don't come from an engineering background at all. I was, I was a, an English teacher and then a journalist in the, back in the day. So humanities was, is my thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But how, how does anyone expect to innovate if they don't apply their feelings? I mean, how, if, if you can't sort of like say, oh, I have this kind of vision, right? How are you going to do anything different if you don't do that than what everybody else has done before? Well, I think everyone accepts that you're doing that. And, you know, engineers are on the spectrum of, you know, how much they um, tap into their I don't know, feelings. I mean, I'm overgeneralizing when I say feelings. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's a spectrum I see in engineers. There's folks that 
are very empathetic towards the end user. And I'm sure a lot of the KDE um, folks are, are that way because you're making a product that is just, it's user interfaces and ease of use and things like that. And so those people, you know, I typically get along with those people quite well. I wouldn't have these contentious, you know, discussions of, you know, tell us hard facts, don't come in with like some emotional, like feeling about how we should solve this problem. On the flip side, like when I worked doing chip design, um, chip design, the stakes are so high, you have to have perfection because you're talking about millions of dollars when you build these chips, you, there's no room for error. So you have to, by the time you're done with this, it's gotta be perfection. No, no uh, day one software patches in right. chip design, typically, right? And so the engineers that gravitate towards that tend to have a different mindset. And I would say they're, a lot of them are not um, particularly customer focused. They don't really care about that. They're just worried about process and, you know, they're going to chew me out because I don't have my environment variable set up correctly or something like that. It's like, <laughs> it's like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was long and rambly. I think you know, that question is like, there's just so many uh, facets to it. I mean, right now I'm living a, a different facet of like women. Why, why aren't women becoming uh, more entrepreneurial in Silicon Valley? It's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. And I feel it every time I go out and talk to uh, the investors to, to keep the company going. When you do a startup in Silicon Valley, it's so expensive here. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to raise money constantly to keep growing the business and, and doing new things. And, you know, I, I think I'm a great storyteller and I can, I can get them excited about my story, but then they still like pass on investing in me. And uh, sorry. And they do that because they may, because you're a woman. Or... Well, I, I think it's subtle. Like, I don't want to say that straight out, but, right. um, you know, when you're doing investment, like it's a whole science to do getting investment money. And so, you know, there's these little tricks and stuff. So you get introductions to these venture capitalists from trusted friends and you go, you pitch them and it's basically just a story. They don't care about the technical stuff in particular. They just want you to come in with a good story, confidence. You know, we're going to go to the moon with this basically is what they want to hear. And you can craft a story that's that's like that. Um, like, and they, they get, ex like, yeah, they get, ex like, oh, sounds like, it sounds like Dragon's Den, the, the TV, I don't, it sounds like Dragon's Den, the TV program. Yeah, I well, haven't seen it. I'm sorry. Well, it's that it's people, it's, it's a reality TV where people go and they're sort of like four millionaires and they pitch uh, most of, uh, and it's designed so that most, most of the people are just crackpots, you know, and they have TV. <laughs> It's exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's interesting. But, you know, the tricks of, of doing this is what's called back-channeling. Right. So so the investors will either, like, if they're, they're great and compassionate investors, they'll say, no, we're going to pass it this time. Come talk to us in the future, which is cool. It's nice to get a no quickly out of them. Um, some will go silent, which is the most agonizing ones. Like, you know, they were giggling. They were having a great time when I was showing them the product. It's like, why are they not responding to me? They like were slapping me on the back as I walked out the door saying, this is so fantastic. You don't hear anything. Or they say like, yes, we want to do some kind of investment. So those are like the three things you typically hear. So you try to back channel in through friends and connections um, and find out what's going on. And there was this common thing that I was, I hear, I still hear it today is like, well, Jerry doesn't pattern match a Silicon Valley founder. So that's a very loaded statement that, you know, comes back. So what does that mean? Right? What, what's different about me? You know, I've ran businesses before. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've had successful products. I ran teams. I know how to get business people into my organization. You know, I'm, I'm good with press, you know, I can promote and it's like, feels like I pattern match an entrepreneur. So what are the variables that are different? And so, you know, I go to my female business entrepreneurs and we talk about this a lot. And of course they, they point me to research and study. Like for instance, in Silicon Valley, only 3% of uh, venture capital money goes to female founded companies. That's really tragic and sad. So, you know, why are females not pattern matching what they're looking for? 
Wow. It makes me think there is a, a correlation, maybe if it's not even in their mind. Well, obviously, that cannot be just by chance. I mean, it can't be. It's, it, that would be crazy. I mean, 50% of the population is female. I mean, how, how does that even compute? You know, no, no, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the demographic in finance, you know, when I go pitch and I pitched hundreds of investors, which you have to do, and I would say 98% of them are probably uh, men. It's it's a, a boys game. And mm -hmm. so, you know, and they're going to respond to like chest pounding and, you know, fist bumping and bravado and this stuff that uh, guys are really good at and uh, women aren't particularly good at. I, I I remember uh, uh, seeing uh, similar documentaries. I guess as you mentioned before about uh, computers, uh, uh, the human computers, the people who did the calculation. I also saw that that uh, the famous film that came out a couple of years ago, and I couldn't help thinking um, that uh, they were sort of like pushed out from being programmers because. That sort of work was seen like grunt work and was probably underpaid. And as soon as it became more glamorous and more lucrative, it's when the, the guy said, oh, you know, maybe we're giving too much money to these to our female colleagues and we should be getting this instead. Mm -hmm. Do you think this may be the case? That Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think, you know, women are typically underpaid, um, you know, for reasons that we mentioned before, you know, women typically don't ask for promotions and raises, and men, um, if even if not deserved, will ask for it. And oftentimes, and you know, it's men are typically a little bit more aggressive and go after things that are lucrative. Um, and so, like, if there's you know a sweet spot in the industry, you know, they go after it really hard and and they um, take over. Um, I mean, I saw that in my first startup, my venture capital backed startup, um, where um, I was having this imposter syndrome. I didn't know if I could be the CEO of the company and, and do all these complicated business things that are associated with, um, uh, you know, running a, a, a company and raising money. And, and so I handed the keys over to another, you know, CEO. And then it was just all of a sudden, it was just like this flood of people coming into my company. It was like all of his buddies and um, it was just a bad situation. There's nothing I could do because I'd um, let go of that power position. A lesson learned. I mean, it's all okay. You know, I learn, I get better. And this time around with my current startup, you know, I'm the CEO, my co-founder, who's male. Um, he's like, I want you to be CEO and I don't want you to ever let go of it. You know, the, when we worked at that previous startup, the biggest problem is the visionary was like shoved in a corner. That was you. And we need you carrying the torch, telling us like where we need to go. We need your intuition of what the market wants. It's just like, you're the perfect person for this. And, you know, you got this, you can do this investing thing. You can do this, you know, CEO thing. And it turns out it's not that hard except for, you know, I may have to like pitch a lot more to investors to hit, you know, because the, for some reason I don't pattern match, but I've been doing it. You don't pattern match. <laughs> I don't, it's like, I, I don't know. I, it feels really bad when I hear that yeah, because, because when you do the <laughs> terrible, it sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I guess, uh, maybe you, maybe there is, uh, uh, you know, silver lining that not pattern matching. That means that at least you are different in some way. Uh, that should be a benefit, I would say, right? You know, and that's I actually, you know, as far as part of my pitch, I'm like, yeah. I just addressed it head on, and that's been very, you know, effective. Saying like, you know, you know, if Silicon Valley keeps investing into the same types of people that are failing over and over again, you see it, like you know, one out of 15 startups make it here in Silicon Valley, like try something different, invest in me. Like I'm going to have different ideas. I'm going to have a different viewpoint on how to chip and chip open this market instead of just turning the crank the same way. Yeah. Uh, so uh, talking about, talking about your current business. Um, so let's talk about tier five. Uh, 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 can I, do I see behind you, uh, some of the glasses that you 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, here's some of the glasses. We're making augmented reality glasses. Yeah. So you slip these on, you flip open the uh, game board on the table in front of you, and this you know, yeah. magical holographic uh, video game world springs out of the table in front of you. Yeah. Um, we have a magic wand, so you can directly interact. And um, it's really cool. You can take traditional video games and just bring them right to the table. And that now you have them like right there in front of you. You can have your friends around the table. Yeah. What do you have? Do you have anything in, in the in your in the catalog yet, or do you have anything that, that that will come out with with the product at the moment? Oh yeah, we have a lot of content in the pipeline for the glasses. Right. Um, so maybe I should rewind and figure uh, to explain how we figured out this path we wanted to go. So at my previous startup, we were doing augmented reality glasses based on the similar technology, but. Um, it was right in the middle of virtual reality, like hype train going. Oh, yeah. It was easy easy for us to raise money. We went out raise raised money just like psh, instantly. And we hadn't really been honed on our consumer message, what we were going to be actually selling. We were so excited about, you know, the, you know, circuit boards and the, you know, sensors and the plastics. And, you know, we put all our emphasis into the the physical product and we really didn't, worry too much about the games or the applications or which market we were going to go after. We just assumed naively we built this thing and everyone's just going to understand the value of it and they're going to flock to it and the games are going to come and the customers are going to come super naive, um, which is really funny. You know, I I've worked with amazing entrepreneurs and product people and that's we've never built products when we didn't know who our customer was. Okay. And so that startup failed for various reasons. We burned through our money. We had bad uh, management. I was like shoved in the corner, which was unfortunate. And, um, but my co-founder Jamie and I got together and like, actually the, the, the story, which is really amazing. Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari called yeah. me after my first startup failed. Right. And he, he's like, I've, destroyed a lot of companies. I've seen this stuff all before. Trust me, I made all the mistakes. And, you know, he gave me a pep talk and he's like, if you want this to happen, you can make it happen. Just go figure out how to do it. And that's the catalyst that we needed to like regroup and rethink things. So getting to your point, I'm sorry, this is taking a long time, but I think it's- a this is, this is a dream interview. You're doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was really interesting is so Jamie and a couple of others that we founded the company together with, we sat around for about six months as we were rebootstrapping the company and figuring out what's going on. And during this time, I'd also like got this huge opportunity to build a navigation and telemetry system for a low earth orbit rocket. So oh, that yeah. was, that was part of a story at KDE, um, conference, um, Academy, I'm sorry. Uh, so we just took our time. Um, I, I took all the money I made from uh, the rocket business and poured into, uh, you know, kind of bootstrapping the company and, and getting going. But we, we spent all this time thinking about what went wrong. Why did we fail so badly? And um, we're like, well, gosh, we, we, didn't, we didn't even think about the customer journey at all. Who, who's our audience? Right. And so we looked at everything. Should we do medical imaging? Should we do education? You know, we just looked at every vertical market that our system could be great in, which is a lot. And we evaluated them on how successful do we think this will be as our kind of sharp spear to penetrate the market with. And we're all gamers. So obviously we kept navigating towards gaming. We're like, okay, gaming's a big space. So now how can we make a, an elevator pitch? For the product that in 30 seconds people understand it right and so that's where this um emphasis on board games everyone knows what a board game is flip the game board open start playing right flip it open you can have your friends around the table and you can play together and that's one of the key values of our products is it's great for solo play but it's also it's amazing when you have multiple people playing together you, know, you can have multiple people playing together even over distance and it feels like you're playing together. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so now how do we keep honing that message so people understand what the experience will be like? We even almost considered calling the product Campfire because we felt so strongly about coming together around the table. 
and uh, the, the name of the company is a whole different story. But that's uh, can you share? Um, it's kind of intriguing in the in the in the in your keynote when you said it's it's an internal joke and I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> so. Well, I, I can't tell you. Like it's probably going to go to our grave or or whatever. We're hugely successful down the road, and we'll be oh. like, okay, here's the big reveal. Um, but Till Five comes about because at my previous company. Yeah. Um, every time a new executive would come in, they hated the name of the company. So the company started off as Til uh, Technical Illusions, which I thought was a decent name. Um, executive came in, I hate it. It needs to be more descriptive, Cast AR. And then new executives came in, like, we hate Cast AR, we need a new name. And then it was going to be Jillian. And then after that, that didn't get much traction. And what then they hired... Wait, Jillian? What? Jillian? Why Jillian? Jillian, like... They had this whole, they spent a, hundreds of thousands of dollars on con, uh, uh, market research, fir market firms to come in and uh, come up with taglines like Jillian, a Jillian ways to play, you know, a Jillian games. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought it was okay. Um, okay. I was just tired, tired of changing the company's name and spending hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. Um, and then after that, um, they hired like another really expensive company that came in, uh, changed the name from Cast AR to Sitecast, which okay. I was uh, super offended by because it's like you basically named it the same thing. Right. It was, it was fine. The name was fine. But um, and then they changed. The funny thing about it is they also wanted to have a specific name for the product itself also. So. Nice. Um, what did they call it? Um, so many names um, you can't remember even the, the name they gave. Yeah, I, I know, I know. It's it's too early in the morning. I'll come back to it. But anyway, you know, the whole company like really, uh, um, like rebelled against this name because it was so bad. And right. anyway, so we're starting tilt five. We're spending this like six months figuring out what we're going to going to do, and we're going to do it right. And um, we're going through the same pain of coming up with a name and uh, someone in the the group said tilt something and then someone's like tilt five and then we all laughed because it was this inside joke and we, we made the decisions like let's go with tilt five like we know from all of these marketing experts that came through it doesn't matter what your name is you can own anything right google is a weird name or lyft or well, Yahoo. that's actually a pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo. You know, it's 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 about what you're doing, not about the name. Yeah. And so we thought that till five, you know, startups pivot all the time, right? You know, who knows? Ten years from now, we might be doing network switches, running KDE on it or something. And till five would be a perfect name for a network switch or something. And uh, uh, so we're like, it makes us laugh every time we think about it. And uh, you know, oh, I know the name. I know the name of the product they wanted. I'm sorry. I'm yes. so early in the morning for me. Um, Voyage AR is what they wanted to call the product. Ooh. All right, Voyage AR for the actual physical device. And um, That's you a, know, isn't, that, isn't that a bit clunky? That's a name. Yeah, very clunky. And so at this time, the company is about seventy people were in this big all hands meeting, and I'm kind of like. I'm in the audience too, and I'm kind of swiveling around looking at the frowns on everyone's faces and the laughing and stuff. And afterwards, you know, we had some artists on board. They started um, making signs, Voyagar, because it reads Voyagar, not Voyagar. And so they made these like superheroes, um, you know, with like Voyagar. And it upset our marketing guy so badly that the company was laughing at like what they thought was good he like rage quit the company and left it was kind of a bummer okay. it was but anyway I mean that's that's the dysfunction that we want to avoid in the new company it's like focus on what's important and so getting back to your original question like we honed in on like here's this message it's really easy it's like a board game but it's fantastic like a video game right you can do board games on it plus you can do video games and in fact our content pipeline, we're signing dozens and dozens of games that are going to come out in the next 12 months. And uh, 
three quarters of them or more are pure video games and they're fantastic. We're, we're now beta testing them with the third party developers and they're really cool. Um, so the content on the video game side, we have a bunch of kind of top down games that just naturally poured over to our system. So think of a video game that's kind of naturally top down mm -hmm. and um, you just, now it's on the table and now you can play it with your friends around the table and you just have all this action in front of you. Things are flying out of the table at, at you when they explode. You can look at your friends when you um, win or lose or whatever. And it, it becomes a very social experience, something that's really difficult to do with video games. You, like, you have to have multiple monitors. You have to have people in different rooms so that you don't see what they're um, actually you know, planning their, on their, their screen, things like that. So there's like this natural fit for video games. And then on the board game side, we went out and we found a couple platforms that are really amazing. So like Tabletopia is this, um, this platform that we um, got ported over to our system that has 1,500 board games on it. So everything from poker and checkers and all these, you know, kind of public domain things that mm -hmm. people love to play, all the way up to Euro style board games that have been licensed and are on the platform. Mm -hmm. And What's really cool about a lot of these games, even the video games, is they're cross-platform. The, the way we developed our SDK, it just seamlessly integrates into the game. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you plug in a pair of glasses, it's like, oh, see, you have a tilt five glasses. Do you want to use that as your primary display? And then, boop, it becomes holographic. Mm. Um, so that means that it's cross-platform. So on day one, even though we may not have tens or hundreds of thousands of units out in the market, you're still going to be able to play with your friends and family if they don't have the headset yet. So you can play Tabletopia and play poker with your friends. They're going to play on a web browser and you're going to play, you know, on your coffee table um, or a video would, game. Will we be way. able to play on, on Linux, to, using Linux too? Yes, yes. Um, now this is where my co-founder always makes me um, put the caveat out there. Um, right now, we're doing all of our development on the latest builds of Ubuntu. Right. And so we're only going to officially support whatever the dev team is using internally. And then all bets are off. You're on your own. Um, good news is, you know, I installed all the drivers and everything onto uh, uh, KDE, and it works. And yeah. I was going to do a, a live uh, presentation at, at um, the conference. That, that, oh, that would have been good. Oh, we didn't have enough time. I ran out and I, yeah. I figured it was too risky to try to like do it, but. Yeah, a live demo. Mm, okay. Mm. Uh, maybe another time. Uh, uh, I, 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 that's fair. I mean, it, it's, it's like uh, Steam only officially supports the same thing, Ubuntu. And uh, uh, but everybody else has managed to make it work on any on every other distribution. So you know, I am not running Ubuntu, and I've got Steam, and it's no problem whatsoever. Yeah, it all comes down to support, and really, yeah. you know, just the re reality is like ninety nine point nine percent of our um, users are going to probably be on Windows or Android in the early days, and internally we do everything on uh, Linux. Uh, Linux was. A very wise choice from the dev team because you know we wanted to support Android and also uh, Windows, so the tools are great to to branch those two directions. And of course, you have ultimate control to debug things in in Linux. So um, it's it's cool. It's uh, so for me. I'm you know you asked me earlier. Um, yeah, you know, I can give you some feedback on the KDE environment. It's like I'm I'm a uh, my entire career for Linux, I've been just an appliance operator, right? Mm -hmm. I've never, never cared to go mess with environment variables or, or get you be a power user and like customize it. It's just like, you know, when I was doing chip design, I was using, you know, Solaris machines and doing VMs into, uh, yeah, into the, the Linux boxes and stuff like that. And I was just like the IT guy would set it up and like show me how to launch, you know, the, the tools and that's the last I think of it. And um, that's been my whole career. I mean, all the way up until uh, rockets. So I did that rocket project and that was really interesting. I got like thrown headfirst into configuring, you know, Linux to fly and, and 
in control rockets. There too, eh? Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had to do I had to do device trees because I was designing this custom uh, hardware and custom drivers, and it was really brutal for me. I probably should have paid attention more in my earlier years how <laughs> to be a more of a power user, but. Um, I told the guys at the rocket company, like, I will, I will make sample applications and I will configure the device tree and everything I need to do to get it to, to, to work, you know, kind of stand alone. You guys have to take it the rest of the way because do not trust my software skills to fly a rocket. Mm. And they promised me, like, oh, yeah, 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 no, none of your code will actually be used. And that was a complete lie. Some of it actually made it in. And I was like... Every time they flew the rocket, I was just like, oh, God, like yeah. that little piece of code. Did I screw it up somehow? Or Would the rocket explode suddenly or something? Oh, yeah. And the rocket exploded three times in a row. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, you know, I'm proud to say it was never a computer failure or a telemetry failure. So yes. uh, and it made it to space um, the fourth time. So no, yeah, I, I mean it's fine. We we uh, uh, the main the main purpose of of the KD community is to is to make um, uh, uh, products for for everybody. That includes that goes from the the developer and the power user down to anybody who wants to use a computer. One of the things one of the things uh, uh, we have recently uh, uh, created is uh, an interface for smart TVs. So that people could just, mm. you know, that is, so it's it's stuff like that, and we have games, and we have word processors and stuff like that, and uh, video editors, and they they are not for. So my question to you is, as an end user, really, I, I it's, uh, I, I of course you are technically minded and you're probably curious and stuff, but as an end user, how do you find it? I mean, uh, I, I I like. Honestly, I like it a lot better than Ubuntu because, you know, 50% of my tools are on Windows, 50% of my tools right. are on Linux. And so the feel between the two, like, you know, I go for a start button and it's in the right place or I, you know, it, there's just a, a feel to it. And maybe this is going to offend your users that it feels a bit like Windows, but it, I appreciate that as a, as just a user. Yeah. Um, of course, it's got, you know, the, the, as you know, Linux does. It's got the pains. Like I, I'm into amateur radio, right. and so you know, I was like, well, I'm going to be talking to Academy. I should, you know, get off of my Windows machine for my ham radio stuff since I have this beautiful Linux machine here that I've been using every day on my workbench. So I'm going to bring all of my ham radio control and um, decoding. You know, you do this digital decoding, all kinds of stuff in ham radio. So there's a ton of tools. And it was not for the faint of heart to get all these amateur radio tools installed and working right, getting the right packages installed and right. and, and figuring out compatibility issues. And, you know, that's, that's always been a struggle for me with, you know, Linux. It's like I just want to install things as conveniently as, mm. as Windows and just kind of have them work and that's usually not the case when you start going off yeah. of the beaten path on uh, yeah know, very kind specialized of... stuff yeah I can see that yeah absolutely it's a it's a valid criticism maybe somebody will be some of a developer getting a developer will be watching this and say oh I'll solve that <laughs> <laughs> well I mean I think the the the, the niche or you get in your oh. like applications you want to stall the more tricky it is it's like uh, yeah uh, yeah. You know, and it's and the less support there is out there, but you know, in general, like getting all of my tools set up, getting Unity installed, and getting um, the Tilt Five tools installed yeah. was just like, boop, yeah, yeah. Just like that. Yeah, Unity should work fine on 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 Linux, as as far as I understand. There is mm -hmm. a, do, have you heard? Uh, okay, this is this is apart from 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 Plasma. This is moving into uh, Plasma and KDE. This is moving into the more the free software, uh, uh, a more general free software arena. Have you heard of Godot? Oh yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. We've uh, talked to some of those folks. Uh, there's interest in bringing our technology over to Godot. Oh, so that would be amazing. That would. Yeah. Be amazing. So there's at least. 
four or five developers that ping us occasionally. And so we've probably been frustrating them because the way our SDK works is there's a native SDK, which is, you know, what our team works with every day. And, you know, on one side of it is our proprietary, you know, uh, tracking and, and stuff that's not really even usable by, you know, a developer. And then on the other side of the wall is the plugin that goes into Unity and Unreal. And so all of our work has been going into documenting and polishing up the SDK for game developers on Windows primarily. And so the native SDK is living primarily in the minds of our internal software developers and in their own you know, document control. So it's not in a, a state that's, you know, we can hand it off to those, the Godot developers to integrate yeah. and make their own plugin. And there's like, you know, sadly, there's not enough demand for us to devote hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of engineering right. resources right. to it right now. And, uh, hmm. you know, maybe someday when, you know, we're just, you know, we, like Valve Software that has like a money fountain in the middle of the company just spewing gold bars out of it. We can like right. put um, 30 engineers on a Linux and uh, Linux game engine or open source game engine uh, that support. Would that would be lovely. I mean, there's other game engines we're looking at too. Uh, Cry yeah. Engine. That'd be, I mean, it's beautiful, oh. right? right? But it's, yeah. again, it needs this, needs this kind of low level. Um, native SDK integration that's we just can't support at the time. Right, right. And do you have a do you have a timeline for when for when uh, it will be, you know, people like me can go and buy it? Yeah, I mean, you you're talking to us on a very exciting like, uh, month right now. So for the last year, we've been giving uh, early access to developers. And so they've been working with super janky hardware to medium janky hardware to slightly janky hardware in firmware and software. Now we got to the point where we felt that it's stable enough, it's still a little janky um, for various reasons that we could give it to our, what we call our beta backers in our, we did a Kickstarter campaign yes. and people paid extra to get early access to the hardware. And so now it's stable enough. We've been starting to send those kits out to the beta backers to start to help us get across the finish line and get it to where it feels um, bug free enough that we right. can send it to our 6,000 other, well, it was 3,000 backers, but we have like, we sold 6,000 or so glasses to these Kickstarter backers. So, you know, this is a big moment. Then those glasses started going out last week and, oh. you know, already the bug reports are flowing oh. in and the software team's heads are exploding. Yes, of course they are. <laughs> so anyway, to your point, um, our goal is, you know, over the summer, we're going to get it um, polished up enough that the primary backers, you know, will get their units. And then after that, we, we have a pre-sale button on our, if you go to the Kickstarter, you can just yeah. get in the pre-sale queue. And it's been super popular. So, you know, we sold, you know, a boatload of units. Um, to the Kickstarter backers, and we've sold almost that many more um, to, to people that just stumbled onto the pre-sale button. We haven't done any marketing yet because we're so far away from being able to, you know, someone to hit buy, and then we can just ship it out the same day. We're that's probably not going to happen until you know winter. Um, we have to catch up on all the pre-sales. Winter this year. Yeah, yeah, and we. Okay, that's okay. And we have a developer program too. So if someone um, is developing a Windows or Android game, uh, we have financial support for folks that have something that fit our criteria of what we were looking for. Um, and if it doesn't fit our criteria, there's also, you know, special cases. We give out free kits to folks that have something that we see is interesting, but not our primary mission for this year. Alison asks if, you would like uh, we have these things well we have done uh, i think one or two called fireside chats and she asked if you would be willing to do a live demo version in a fireside chat to our developers and our community would that be something you would like to do sure i could do that anytime yeah yeah i mean it would be cool because then 
you'll get the developers from 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 KD thinking about this, and it would be an interesting thing to 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 show them and stuff like that. You know, I think um, supporting Linux is going to be important for our strategy in the long run because our uh, developer program. You know, we're seeing a lot. You know, three quarters of the people that are approaching us are game developers, but there's this huge influx of people that have non-gaming applications they want to do with our system. So oh, yeah. ed education, medical, it just, it's yeah. across the spectrum. And many of these um, groups aren't using Windows or Android. You know, they have special requirements, like, you know, it needs to be extra secure and things like that. And there are even groups that are doing embedded style systems mm -hmm. where they want to take our glasses, hook it to their in embedded compute device and, and do very special applications with them that maybe are more mobile than say a tabletop experience. And yeah. we think that's really interesting, although we can't put, you know, engineering resources behind it. We want to keep nurturing that for when, when those different vertical markets start to uh, mm -hmm. um, take uh off. Yeah, I would. I would like to point out that that that, that our, <laughs> although our, probably our old uh, our most <coughs> in let's say in the in the technical world our most well known. Okay, let's call it what it is. Product is the plasma, the KD plasma desktop. Mm -hmm. Our most downloaded and used software is not that at all. It's uh, something called Krita, which is a painting program for artists. Mm -hmm. And and most of the people who download and use it, use it on Windows. We do not produce software exclusively for, for, for Linux. Mm -hmm. That is, obviously, we would like everybody to use Linux, but that is, you know, that is a religious thing. Uh, <laughs> but, but the fact is that, that uh, 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 Kagan Live, our video editor, Krita, our, our painting program, uh, KD Connect, the thing that connects Android to all these things work on Linux, but they also work on Windows and Mac and Android mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, uh, it's not uh, producing maybe a, or a game or something that could, could properly uh, uh, or could, you know, use the AR aspect of your, of your product. Uh, it would not necessarily be for for Linux itself. It could mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, uh, some of our developers use Linux to develop their games and, Lin uh, and, and Unity, Linux and Unity, and they just export it to Windows. And, yes, that, that's what uh, we do also. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we do that internally all the time, and some yeah. of our developers, that's the preferred um, workflow. So that's that's definitely a way. And, it's worth worth mentioning. Like I talk about, like the holographic or the, you know, that's another religious thing saying holographic, even though it's not really a hologram. But um, the three D aspect of it, you know, basically. So we have a a game. It's it's a a tabletop gaming assistant um, platform called Fantasy Grounds. It has thousands of Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder uh, adventures, right. um, all licensed. You can do little microtransactions to buy them, but. It really doesn't use any of the 3D effects of our, our system at all. It's just using our system as a giant flat display that you can put on the table. And there's the terrain laid out in front of you for your campaign. You can put your miniatures down and move them across the terrain. And it has all of the uh, gameplay guides built into it. And, and so you're talking about like Critter. Like, you know, you don't have to necessarily do anything 3D. If it's a paint program, you can make a interesting um, painting program where it's collaborative and you have people all like using the magic wand to like scribble all over the table. In fact, I'm dying for um, something that's, you know, maybe for a younger audience, which is just a, a sandbox for them to like scribble on and play with each other and uh, maybe integrates our voice chat in it. You know, there's, you know, we've been looking at the market, like what do people do when they're kind of hanging out in video games? And a lot of times it's not even playing the game. It's just a collaboration space. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's family members that are separated. They just like to get together and chat with their friends and doodle while they do it over mm -hmm. long distances. And I think I'd love to see that on our system. And we don't have anything like that quite yet. So. No. 
Alison, would you like to ask, would you like to join us? Sure, I can absolutely jump back on camera. So, I mean, I think a big question I had after listening to your keynote, Jerry, is besides what got you involved, which I think uh, being around the farm, uh, your brother and your dad kind of got you into the racing scene pretty pretty clearly um but what was let's say what was one car that still to this day if you could have it in your garage what car would it be uh, it would be an opal gt and i would put a buick um, v6 in it i i think oh, they're I was not expecting that yeah yeah um yeah, the Opal GT, I think it's so cute. It looks like a uh, miniature Corvette. And I've seen quite a few people put, uh, they wedge a, a, a Buick V6 into it and it's uh, it moves. Um, and I, yeah, that's all I have to say about it. I'd probably do, uh, I'd paint it green. I have a kind of predilection for kind of a dark green. So I, yeah, I put a little thought into this. Oh, it's kind of fun. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, if you want to hear a car story, um, I way back when I was building race car chassis, sometimes I would do custom builds for um, drag race cars and other things outside of the circle track racing that I did. And I took a uh, Triumph Spitfire for a gentleman, put a full roll cage in it. So basically we gutted the inside and I managed to put a roll cage in it that was low enough where the soft top could still retract and put all the they call them sissy bars and stuff down alongside the doors all the doors still worked it was a big challenge and he wanted to put a um, supercharged v8 small block chevy in it and so that was really challenging getting that under the hood and so full tube chassis in the front we got the v8 mounted as close as we could we cut the firewall back we brought it back as far as we could to and still have a place for the driver and passenger in it and uh, we started to fit the hood on it. It had to have a little hump for this, you know, Paxton blower or whatever that was on it. Um, but we couldn't, we couldn't get the hood all the way back on it to, to match up with the body. So he went to a body shop and they extended the, the hood by, it was probably uh, four inches, five inches or so. And uh, when it was, and then it had, a nine inch Ford rear axle that we'd cut down. So a big heavy duty axle in the back and a full swing arm suspension on it. And he put these racing slicks in it and, and we managed to get the tires to fit up underneath it where you could, if you looked at the car, you're like, something seems off on it. Um, thing was truly scary when it was done. Um, but it's oh, kind of along the same lines as that Opal GT. It reminded me when it was done, it um, was just a tiny bit longer, like the Opal GT had kind of this like sleek look to it. And it was it was pretty amazing. Um, wow. Absolutely. Wow. I can talk about cars all day long. <laughs> I think that a video of that I have. Um, I think I have a Polaroid picture of it. That's all I have. This is like in the early 90s, like, oh, Okay, okay. I had a, a camcorder, like a VHS camcorder. That's all I had for video recording back then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's well, a different time. Yeah. I think my favorite car that I've owned was a, a 65 Nova two-door. Um, it had a straight six in it. It wasn't a powerhouse, but it was a really fun car to drive. It was a cute little boxy car. Wow. Yeah, those, those are the, the small ones. You can yeah. get them to move a bit more uh they're, they're a little bit nimble maybe they don't have all the horsepower but it's the agility that that gets you after a while yeah it was really uh, it was i was kind of scared driving it because it was uh it was pretty tinny like they had really thinned out the metal on those uh, little novas metal. and it only had a, a lap seat belt on it and it was we just did not have modern si i'm sorry is that legal no, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, oh, yeah. Anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. But in 1965, they didn't care about, oh, you know, okay. driver safety. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, I have such my. fond memories of race cars. Um, the entire time I did race cars, and I, I really didn't cover this, I don't think, too much in the uh, Academy talk, but um, again, I'm all about inventing new things. And so there's so many funny and fun and innovative things that I, I did. So one of the, the things that got me in trouble at the racetracks, I built a traction control system. And this was, you know, cars on the street were just coming out with traction control systems. So I built it for the race car. And um, I wire wrapped a 6502 processor on a circuit board. Right. You know, really, it was the, pretty the, advanced. What is the VIC-20 one, right? Correct, and the C64 one as well. All right. I wire wrapped this thing together. I came up with this quite clever idea of we had a rev limiter in the car so that it couldn't over rev the motor, but I could hook into the rev limiter and trick it into thinking that the engine was over revving. So that's how I controlled the power to the back wheels. And so I me measured the engine RPM off of the distributor. And then I put a sensor on the front wheels, a hull sensor and a magnet that would measure the front wheel spin. I fed that all into a 6502 and I did some simple math to figure out how fast the back tires were spinning versus the front. And I could dial in like the percentage of rear tire spin I wanted in the car. And so after I got that all dialed in and working, I was dominating. I was like winning every race. It was just, if I didn't like get caught up in a collision or something, I would probably win because I could just floor it um, out of the corner and it would just bring the back tires up to a certain amount of tire spin and then it would start to throttle back the motor. An interesting side effect of this is rev limiters in cars, the way they control the RPM is they start to cancel the ignition, so the spark plugs, so they start cutting spark to the engine. Right. And so you have a lot of raw fuel dumping into the exhaust system at this point. And so much raw fuel was going into my headers at the time they started glowing like red, red hot and actually burned the paint the first time I raced it on the inside of the, uh, the car and it got so hot that I had to turn it off part way through the race. Right. So I had to get all this asbestos stuff and like insulate it so I didn't like burn myself. But the audience loved it too because of all this raw fuel. My exhaust went up and over and out the side of the car out towards the audience. So my car is shooting flames constantly. And uh, <laughs> it looked like a pro dragster or something going down the, the back stretch and the audience just like, ah, they love That's it. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. It well, sounds okay. very dangerous. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A chance of a lifetime. Oh, that would be fantastic to, to drive something like that. Oh, Definitely it's a thrill. I, well, you know, what's funny is I, I'm sorry, I can talk cars all day. I, I, I'll give a couple more stories for the motorheads out there. So um, I did a, a bunch of other things. My father, who was like a big fan of me racing at this point, he thought this was going to be the thing that turned my life around. And so big supporter all of a sudden. Um, he, uh, uh, was always wait, encouraged wait, me. Wait, He's wait, wait, wait. Wasn't he scared for you? Wasn't he scared you'd kill yourself? I mean, originally, yeah, yeah. You know, it sounds really, really dangerous. Uh, yeah, there is some danger involved with it. People do die every year in racing. Um, uh, I, I, I put a lot of effort into safety, and you know, but from encouragement, encouragement from my father. So mm -hmm. my car was probably a bit safer than others. Um, okay. But anyway. That's a different story. Um, but my father, you know, he wanted me to become a pro race car driver and continue my career and go back to North Carolina and work with this racing team that he found. And he was always frustrated with me because, you know, I'd make a really fast race car, but I couldn't leave it alone, you know. And so I was always like fiddling with it. So, you know, there's this traditional style of suspension on the on these cars, and I was always changing the suspension. So there was the suspension that I designed and I completely ripped my car apart halfway through the season. Um, it's called cantilever suspension. It's kind of like what you see on an Indy car. They do a push rod version of it where the springs are mounted inboard. And so there's some vir virtues to doing this and I won't go into those, but I made this really complicated cantilevered suspension and I was trying to debug it in the middle of the season. I'm losing points. I'm not progressing as fast as I could. He's so upset at me that I'm like, you know, 
not going out to win. I'm going out, I'm out there like fiddling with the car all the time. He didn't understand that that was the thing that thrilled me more than winning was um, innovating. And uh, eventually I got that dialed in and, and that was like a huge advantage for me as, as well. But all these different things like changing the suspension, you know, some of these things got banned by the racetrack. If I got too fast, they don't want, you know, a single car winning every single week. So they'd ban it and I'd have to take it off the car. And um, yeah, so, it, was, so, it was quite so a joy. They were, making, they were making rules up because of you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, I was in this racing circuit, it was called the I-5 Challenge. And um, one of my mentors in the racing uh, that, that helped me with racing, he said, you know, you should always assume if it's not on the rule sheet, it's legal and just do it. And so right. that's, that's how rules get implemented. Like it wasn't on the rule sheet and someone did it. Um, another thing that got banned is I had a linear actuator hooked to one of the suspension components and I had this, this motor um, control with a little switch in the driver's compartment. So on dirt tracks, they go from kind of a, a wet situation. They water the track, it's really sticky and you want your suspension set up one way for a sticky track, but over the night it gets drier and drier. And sometimes there will be a transition in the middle of the race where it goes from sticky to dry and you really wish you had a different suspension set up. And so I had this motor that would move the suspension component between the two settings that I needed and I actually used a bicycle brake cable hooked to the suspension component that came into the, on the dashboard and I had this little like some Sharpie marks on the on the dashboard and I would just reach over and hit the switch going down the back stretch and I'd watch this little brake cable move over to the, you know, say the dry slick position. Then all of a sudden in the middle of the race, I'd take off going faster again. And that was like a huge advantage for me and I'd start winning and uh, they banned that too. Wow. That's okay. actually what drove me away from racing, right? As like the, you kept getting banned. Yeah, these things would get banded. And the final straw was um, I was making my cars lighter and lighter. So I had carbon fiber wheels and super lightweight wow. chrome ollie tubing. And then they, you know, that was my advantage. And then they uh, put this minimum weight limit that was ridiculous. I it was just too heavy. Those. Uh, <laughs> there was a race, there was a race, um, I think a few years ago. Guy has his own, gosh, I cannot forget, his, I cannot remember his name. He's got his own racing team. He's, uh, he does videos doing tricks in cars and they build cars to do these new tricks in for, for the new videos. He's got huge YouTube following, but he ended up getting on a racing team and the car got so damaged during the race, but it was still running. He think got first or second place at the end of the race and they said you have to weigh your car oh and no they disqualified him because he was you know half half a pound above or below the the benchmark and my goodness it, it really like they did nothing to this car other than put the body back together and <laughs> they still got disqualified uh, oh but... yeah that happened uh, it's unfortunate yeah we had to drive across scales and uh the, uh, you had to like try to calculate how much fuel. So by the end of the yeah. race, you're just right at the limit. Yeah. I had a situation, this was kind of funny. So they would do spot checks on your car and they would check dimensions of the car occasionally. And so I was going out for qualifications at this one racetrack and they went and they measured my uh, rear spoiler of the car and it was too high by an inch or two or something like that. And they're like, you, they're like, either take it off or you can't um, qualify. And I'm like, I'm, I can't run without a spoiler. Like, you're not going to yeah. you know, qualify at all. So I went back to my pit area and we had these coilover adjustable shocks. And so I lowered the ride height of the car by two inches. And the car ride height's only like four, four and a half inches. So I'm riding about two inches. Oh, wow. I went out and set the track record that night on the wow. running. But the entire way around the track, I was bottoming out. I'd go into the corner and the right side frame rail was just hitting the, the track so hard. And as soon as they turned their back, I went under my car and I raised the car back up to, 
and uh, okay. I finished the race. Luckily, they didn't check at the end, but yeah. um, that was wow. pretty interesting. I set the, uh, the the record at the track. It eventually got broken by one of my friends that I built him a car uh, with, so I'm kind of proud that I wonder if he still has it. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, it brings up this whole conversation of the drivers have to be great, but the cars have to be even greater. I, I mean, it, NASCAR NASCAR is implementing a new body style with new suspension, new uh, aerodynamics, all of it for for the upcoming season. And we'll see what teams <laughs> end up keeping up because they're com they've completely changed uh, their, their traction control, their axles, everything's being um, changed on NASCAR for the first Ooh. time in a decade, almost. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at NASCAR, like the pre... I love NASCAR. <laughs> I look at NASCAR, you know, it's funny is uh, we had these derogatory, derogatory terms for drag racers and for um, asphalt yeah. racers, like every, all the different racing yeah. groups like would like tease each other, but What's funny is we tease the asphalt guys, like if we took our dirt cars with all this advanced um, suspension on there, we'd eat your lunch, oh, right? It's true though, because for, for, for dirt racing, you put so much more into the car, where on asphalt, your teams get lazy in the sense of they're not looking to innovate. Well, they're not allowed to either, because the yeah. motivation is to slow the cars down, because on asphalt you get going dangerously fast, and they have to limit the cars. You talked about their, um, the drivers. There was something really interesting that happened to me over the five years that I, I did dirt track racing. First year I go out, I had this thought in my mind, I'm going to be an amazing race car driver. I go out, and I'm like the slowest, like every single week. I was terrible, but I got a little better. I worked with my mentor. He taught me how to set the car up so it, the car drove a little better. So the next year I got a little bit better, but he told me, he's like, you need to visualize. He's like, you need to go to your, your shop and lift the car up and put it on blocks so the wheels are off the ground. And he, I want you to sit in the car, close your eyes, and drive the car during the week. Just put all the inputs into the car and do that for hours and hours during the week. And I did it. And that... You take the wheel off and you get, you, yeah, you it the weight and you can feel the wheel. Yeah, yeah, that quickly um, improved my racing. And then over the years, I started getting faster, moving to faster cars and sprint cars and things like that. And as I moved up in, in racing, every time I would transition to a little bit faster type of car, it was almost like a reset. So when I'm going around the track, there's just so much input, like, brakes and steering wheel and gas and you're just hitting all these things and you're you're feeling the the friction on the wheels as they start to scrub in the corner and, and things like that and uh it's it's a lot of mental processing when you move to a, a car or even start racing period and then it turns to muscle memory and then you get to start thinking about other things in the the track on the track and um what was really interesting is occasionally these race car drivers um, in lower class cars couldn't make it to the racetrack. And the points are associated in this type of racing with the car, not the driver. And so they'd ask me, like, can you run my slower type of car? And I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll run your car. And so you jump in and you go around. And I noticed like a car that would have felt like incredibly fast and I, I just could barely keep up with all the mental, you know, requirements to drive it was like, now it's just like muscle memory and I'm looking up into the audience and I'm looking like 20 cars ahead and I'm just, it's, it, it was just a, the neatest feeling and it, it was like this really unfair advantage. Like when I would drop into other people's cars, I would frequently win. So people would want me to race their car <laughs> when they couldn't make it to the race day. Make but then I'd get back in my car and I'd be on the bleeding edge and it'd be just like, I'm just trying to get to that muscle memory like state where where I can start thinking like five cars ahead. Make that was sense. another thing my mentor taught me. He's like, you know, I, I recorded some videos and sent him a VHS tape 
And he's like, I can sense by watching how you're driving, you're not looking enough cars ahead. So when you're going down the front stretch, you should be looking across the track at what's happening around the corner. He's like, your head should be looking out the side of the car, maybe more than what's in front of you. Because if you're right next to a car, and they do something, you're just going to bump into them, right? And in dirt cars, you're just constantly bumping into people. Just bump into them. Don't worry about that. Figure out your line. Yep. Yep. He also taught me a lot of psychological tricks, which were pretty cool. So under yellow flag conditions, you can get in the head of the um, drivers in front of you by doing certain things. And this is kind of ne <laughs> nefarious and evil, I guess, but... There's some of these things you can do. You can pre-program a driver to believe that you're gonna pass them on a certain side during a yellow flag condition. So in a yellow flag condition, for those that don't watch racing, like all the cars are lining back up and moving slow. And there's a lot of opportunity as a driver to like screw around a little bit. So he's like, if you wanna pass someone on the high side during yellow flag, just keep pulling up alongside them on the low side and give them a thumbs up and be like, waving to them, let, let them know that, that, they're, that you are there, especially being a, a contender and a, a good racer. And then when that race actually starts, they'll tend to like go down to try to block you and then just be prepared to go around the top side. And he said other things to do like before the race starts or in, during yellow flag conditions, just bump in, in the back bumper. And if you can get them flustered, and the way you can know that you're getting the other driver flustered just by gently bumping them during yellow flags, is you start to see their head pivoting around. And that's how, how you can tell whether you're getting under their skin. And if you get them flustered, they're more likely to over accelerate when the green flag drops again. And they'll give you a, a bit of an advantage to drive around them in more of a, you know, be cool and, and, uh, yes. So I could go on and on for hours no, about me cars. Too. Me too. I guess one last question. It's more of, of your opinion on it. What do you most prefer between front, rear, or four-wheel drive? I think it depends on uh, the type of racing. Car. Yeah, yeah. On dirt, you definitely want uh, rear-wheel drive yeah. because yeah. you need that to get you around the corner. Um, on rear wheel drive cars on dirt you you snap the back tires and you actually keep this yep. tire spin going so you can pivot the corner um i haven't done a ton of asphalt driving any asphalt driving i did i tended to drive it just like a dirt car um, which has some negative um, side effects um, i probably would have um, been better to have a four-wheel drive car or a front wheel drive car in this situation um i think I'm just thinking back to the first time I ran a, uh, an asphalt uh, endurance race. These were really fun, long races. I kept blowing out my right rear tire because I would pitch it in the corner and I'd light up the back tires and I'd wear my tires out really fast. And it was just like, I was like, why are all these asphalt drivers going so fast? I was like gobbling up two or three positions and I would just go to the high line and I just drifted around the corner and, you know, 15 laps in, I'd have a flat tire and go back into the pits. I actually didn't make it through that particular race because I ran out of spare tires. Oh no. I was having a good, I was having a good time. It was fun. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. I once had a tire blow up on me. Luckily I wasn't going fast. I was actually coming to a stop and just in the Arizona heat completely exploded. I had a hole about this big in my tire wow ah uh, it was it was it, it's scary going i mean regardless of how fast you're going if you're going too if you're going fast and you pop a tire like that it's dangerous it's yeah you know what's dangerous. interesting with all of this racing that i've done it's i think it's made me a bit safer of a street driver i don't drive yeah. fast on the street because i know how bad collisions hurt and if you don't have the right safety gear you know, one of the things I learned very early on in racing was like constantly tighten your belts, tighten, 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 tighten. Like, you know, so if your belts are loose, the first year that I raced, I had, you know, didn't know that I had to keep them like insanely tight and you would like just barely tap something and you'd end up with these huge bruises and it hurt so bad. And if you're like tightened into the, 
the car. Mm -hmm. You're one with the car. Yeah, you feel the car better. You don't get hurt. But my first years of racing, I'd have things like someone would rub up against my tire and pop it. And then I would do the natural like, you know, there's an input change to my car and I would jerk the wheel or something in the wrong direction or I would just give input to the car and it would cause the situation to be worse. I would spin out or I'd hit the cement wall or hit a cement filled tire. And by like the fifth or sixth year that I'm doing this racing, um, you know, something would happen to the car and I wouldn't give any input. It's just like you learn, you know, hold your line even if the car is you know, something happens to input, just let it settle out for a fraction of a second, you know, because usually if you add input, you're going to make it worse. And I've, I've flipped cars, I've sent cars off the end of the track, you know, it's, I've done all kinds of really fun things. It was actually very thrilling, like crashes were just as thrilling as the actual racing itself. I yeah. can imagine. We do these events, they call it rollover contests, where you would, you'd have a one wheel ramp and you'd go down the back stretch and come around the front stretch in front of the audience and you'd flip a little like Honda car over and stuff. And yeah, you, know, you, you start to kind of learn like how bad something's going to hurt when you, uh, when you do these things. And it's surprisingly like rolling a car over is not too bad. Yeah. Surprisingly. I mean, depending on how fast you go and how big the impact, if it's, it's if it's not at a very high speed, you're, probably a, a, assuming you have a helmet mm -hmm. a helmet and your harness in tight you're less likely to hurt yourself if the car rolls over because you have the body of the top of the car to sort of protect you yeah you know there's something that was kind of interesting um that i learned part way through racing also and this came after like hundreds of crashes um it was a lot of these tracks have walls on the outside of the track, right? And if you're right next to the wall, you hit it, not okay. a big deal. You, you don't, it yeah. damages your car or something, but it doesn't really hurt, right? You don't, it's nothing to yeah. fear if you're close to the wall. If you're at the bottom of the track, you get pitched sideways and you go and you hit it like head on, that hurts, right? And um, so I, d I developed this driving technique where I became kind of fearless of the outside wall. And a lot of racers are scared of that outside wall because it can grab you and suck you into it and damage your car. So on the dirt track, as the night goes along, there's little pebbles and stuff that develop up near the wall. And um, people don't like to get in those pebbles because you causes you to go up into the wall. But I found if I just relax in the beginning of the race and I just run the high line, and this type of racing was called inverted racing. So the fast cars are in the back, so it's more exciting and you have to pass a lot of cars. And so I was usually pretty fast time, so I would didn't it didn't matter. I was already in the back, so I'd go to the high line and I would start to work my own groove up there, and I'd work the pebbles out of that groove, and I'd be running it, and I'd be falling behind. My fans would just be like, "Oh my God, something's wrong!" But I'd get faster and faster and faster, and I'd make my own line, and I would just start cruising, and then I would just start passing people like crazy halfway through the race because I'd cleaned out my own line up there, and it was still usually sticky because it was still wet because people don't drive up there. And I won a lot of races driving the high line and the, the back right quarter panel of my car was always severely damaged because you're pitching the car and you're tapping the wall and nothing bad happens if you pitch and tap the wall with the back of your car. You just feel it. And it's, it's really this fun experience because you pitch the car and you hear clunk and it's like, oh, there's the, there's the wall and you're kind of cruising around, you know, in the pebbles and stuff and, um, and it's exciting for the audience because sometimes sparks fly up and stuff. And yeah, I actually, there was, I damaged one of my buddy's cars. I was driving his car. He was not there one night and, uh, um, I was just eating everyone up and I was running the high side and I was like bumping the wall with the back quarter panel and just all these fun things. And I got a little too close and, uh, hit the back axle, ripped like the suspension out underneath the uh, back axle. And this was actually probably one of the the times that I could have severely gotten hurt. Like his car, he hadn't put a, a driveline safety hoop in it. And so when the back axle came loose, the driveline fell out of the uh, transmission and it started flipping around, you know, under the car, poking holes in the driver's compartment. And when we stopped, the 
the yoke of the drive shaft was sitting inside the driver's compartment, you know, kind of alongside me. I'm like, that was, that yeah. was, Yikes. I need to digitize some of these old videos. I have some old VHS videos that um, I've never put Absolutely. online. Oh, oh, please send those over. Please, please, Paul. please. I would <laughs> love to see those. Paul, you're muted. Um, yeah, I know. I, I just, I, <laughs> For me, I, I, I am not, uh, I don't consider myself a very good driver at all. And I'm kind of a scary cat of, 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 of driving. I'm just sort of like in awe of how dangerous everything sounds, you know, and how. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, I talked about this in the Academy talk. It was my mental state back then was much different than now too. Like I talk very fondly of doing these dangerous things like yeah. you know i'm a hero or whatever i'm amazing i was fearless and and actually it goes back and i, I talked about this in high school i was severely picked on i was the, the kid that was you could yeah. make cry really easy yeah. and i uh you know it really brutalized in school but then i i started running with all the bad kids all the stoners and smokers and you know goth kids and I really got into that culture, but mentally I was, I still like, didn't have a lot of mental self worth at this time. And I think that caused me to act out. Like I was always in trouble with the police, you know, for various reasons, speeding or doing something silly or being out past curfew, or you can imagine all the other things that a teenager might do. Uh, I got into racing because it was this crazy, insane thing that kind of built up this persona that I was developing of being like wild and crazy. But honestly, you know, some of these dangerous things that I did, it was because I just didn't really care about myself. And so as I matured as a person, that was also another reason I started to get out of racing. It's just like I started feeling more self-worth, you know. I felt less compelled to go do rollover contests and, and some of these crazy things. And that progressed through my 20s. And it's just like now that I reflect back to like, I really didn't like myself um, through that period of time because my self-worth had been eroded by all these bullies. Mm, 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 um, so I don't have too much desire to go like put myself in harm's way. That's why I don't race anymore. I mean, I still like right now my heart's racing. I'm thinking about it. It's like, oh, I could hop in a car and like a few weeks I could probably be like tapping the wall, going down the back stretch and you know, running that high line and how exciting that would be. Yeah, but running a company is exciting too, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's not exciting, but Probably and, still equally. And, you know, making cool, inventing cool stuff. That must be really, really satisfying too. I love it. You know, I worked on a bunch of different projects. And, you know, although I'm proud of some more than others, you know, for instance, I worked on some really complicated chip designs. And I'm proud of what I did in them. But I also, and this is probably my narcissistic side, but I like to be able to, like, you know, say, like, I built that, and it was a success, and friends say, like, that was amazing, and, like, just with colleagues and other people, and, like, some of these chip designs, I worked on, like, really hard things in these chips, and they went into products, and no one even knows that I worked on that, and, you know, colleagues, you know, don't don't recognize me necessarily about for doing these things, and, but then there's other things that were, you know, quite simple to do, um, compared to like that really hard chip design and it, it's a little bit more satisfying because it has a consumer aspect to it like consumers were satisfied by it my colleagues are like that's amazing that you put a team together and you were able to get a product out so fast so I, I think I tend to gravitate more towards products because it fulfills like and hmm. kind of a need that I have yeah it kind of wraps it all up isn't it you get the product and people can use it it's it's the you know, you do a whole thing. I don't think that's narcissistic at all. I, I, I do think, I do think that that uh, uh, having imposter syndrome and nar narcissism do not go together. So <laughs> you have to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, sometimes I feel guilty. Like you know, I'm feeling guilty right now, just talking about my um, life story. Like why? I don't know. I just feel like I'm bragging. Like I'm bragging about race cars, and you know. But in a, I also. Kind of get in a, a dopamine hit from it. 
It's yep. an interview about you. What are we going to talk about otherwise, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I get it. As a female, yeah. at least, I get it. Um, I, I had a phone call earlier today or a video call earlier today where speaker I've worked with wanted to actually sit down and, and sort of interview me in the sense of we're working together on more projects. She wants to get to know me better. Mm. She's tell me your story. And I sat there was like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I can tell you my background. I can tell you my accomplishments. I don't want to it's tell hard. you my accomplishments, but yeah, it's, it it's there. So I get it. It's, it's a different form of imposter syndrome, I think, uh, in the sense of women in general don't normally lift themselves up the way a male would yeah mm -hmm. yeah look yeah at, look at female athletes compared to male athletes yeah so yeah i think you you hit on it earlier too so yeah i mean it's, 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 it's such a complicated thing what's your opinion like i mean i don't think i even scratched one one hundredth of like the the factors out there that's causing this big divide and tech sports you know insert Everything. industry yeah everything really so it, it's 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 something i hope that if if i have children and their generation don't have to deal with as heavily as we do mm. right now i think it's getting better honestly just a you know a ray of hope it's there slow progression though yeah you you kind of feel yeah. like like it's going to change really quickly but now it's been like 30 years or so that i've been like you know kind of, well 25 years, 20 years, whatever. I don't know. It's been a long time. I've been pushing through all this and feels a little bit better, but sometimes I think, uh, is it, is it really better or is it because I've learned some skills to be more like confident? Yep. That's a question I ask myself all the time and yeah. I'm sure many others do. Hmm. I wish yeah, I, don't... I could walk into a boardroom and have that persona of I'm the boss in here, I'm on top, which obviously I'm not anywhere near that point yet in my career. But but if I got into a meeting and I said, look, I own this, this is mine, this is how we're gonna do it, people would look at me like I've lost my mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. It's not normal. Yeah, I've had through my career these moments where I've overstepped my confidence. Um, I get pulled aside by folks and say, like, you're being very abrasive. I'm like, I'm being abrasive. Like 30 minutes ago, Joe Blow over here was like pounding his chest and threw a temper tantrum mm -hmm. and left. And then everyone came back and was OK with it. And I would just express a strong opinion. Um, I think that's really unfair. Like we still like, even though if you gain the confidence, you have to walk a fine line, you know, insert other derogatory terms. Like I'm just using abrasive. I've had other like worse yep. terms. Like you're being, you know, yeah. insert word uh, there. And it's like, you know, just last week, my colleague was doing worse than that. And, but I don't take very much crap anymore. And that was kind of what was disappointing about my previous startup yeah. is that somehow I, because of the imposter syndrome or fear, I let go of all that confidence that I've had for years and years. Like I had just come out of Valve Software where I put this entire amazing team together, had like this, you know, with complete confidence, like just assembled this team. We did amazing things, felt good about it. And then ended up quickly getting into a situation where I was just kind of pushed into corner. It felt like, you know, my early twenties again. Now it doesn't feel like that, you yeah. know, my new startup and I'm, we're resisting that from in every way or from preventing that from out. happening. Good. Well, I, I can honestly keep asking you questions all day and I'm sure Paul could too. <laughs> or I could just apologize for the rest of my, the rest of people of my, of my oh. just <laughs> and just it's, shut up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's society. Every everyone needs to do their part to make it better. And it's like, yeah. you know, 
slowly but surely. Like my father, like I think he, you know, he wanted to keep me safe and some of the guidance he gave me wasn't the most, he probably wouldn't have given the same guidance to, you know, a son or something at the time or, so. I have a brother okay. too, so I, I, I'm the older one, but mm. there's differences between the way I was treated at one age and how my brother was treated at the same age. So it's just culture, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. We'll get there. It. We'll get there. I'm sure the open source community is much better at this than a lot uh, of other no, industries. Not, not really, unfortunately. I mean, I, oh. I, 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 I love the, 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 the free software and open source uh, community to bits, but in this aspect, we, it is not, it is not better, unfortunately. All right. Uh, well, that chop, chop folks. We got to get, make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm happy to say in our startup, we have a lot of diversity and that's one of the things that we talk about and think about all the time. So quite a few females in the company you know, all the way through the stack. So, you know, doing engineering and and uh, I, I wish we had a little bit more on the management side. So I'm constantly looking. But, and I, 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 I love the dynamic. Yeah. I, I do not yeah. contribute to, 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 to the free software thing in, in exclusivity. So it is in general, you know, this engineering technical thing that, that, that permeates whole society where you have, you know, um, um, classes at, at college for engineers where there's maybe three or six percent of women only, you know, and so that, of course, mo if free software was started by engineers, it's, uh, it, it started out male dominated and it just continued being male dominated. Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. unfortunate, of course. I mean, yeah, but and we have to do something active to change that. It's not enough to just say, "Oh, you know, someday this will be solved," because it it's been I think what it's been thirty years decades. and it hasn't yeah. and it hasn't solved. It hasn't been solved. To, to be honest with you both, I think the solution to a lot of this is going into primary schools, high schools, getting girls involved at a young age in science and engineering mm -hmm. and that's and, and helping them stick through it through college because somehow also maybe uh help the parents understand yes i don't i don't, yep. I don't know instead of buying uh, I, I don't know instead of buying uh, gender specific oh the book you wish you <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming my Bible. Oh, yeah. um, I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, it's it's not so much about parenting as the way you were treated as a child and your upbringing has affected the way you react to things and you interact with things in your day to day, and a lot of that has to do with things you, how you react to your children if you have children, um, mm -hmm. and. I love my parents, but, but I know their flaws. Nobody is perfect. And I personally want to be a better version. You know, I want to evolve. I want to be, if I ever have kids, I want to be as loving as my parents are, but an improved loving version of that. And I think that what you said, Paul, about helping parents of the, of girls who are interested in science and technology and engineering understand that that's that's normal mm. that's not a boy's hobby it's it's a hobby and it's not gender related absolutely, absolutely. Is, and, and a lot of what philippa perry talks about is ways to get around any you know negative feelings towards a lot of what she says, I guess, is how did you feel at that age? Was there something your parents made you feel or said to you that made you feel a certain way that you're trying to protect your child from right now? I think that's a, a very, very salient point. You know, I, I look back at my father 
and look at the advice he gave. It was all good advice um, from the frame of trying to keep me safe, yep. right? You know, uh, and I think I parents, parents go for that. Without, yeah. I don't go anywhere without either pepper spray or a Swiss Army knife because if I ever need to defend myself, yeah. a man is probably going to be stronger and larger than I am. And regardless of the fact that I'm married or not, I still want to be able to be comfortable walking around and not mm. risk that. And that was something my parents instilled in me and something that I don't, I wish I didn't have to worry about. Yeah. You need but, to worry um, about it though. That's the thing is like you, you ask any woman, like, you know, at what age did um, some guy do some skeezy mm -hmm. thing to you? And it's like oh, yeah. super young, right? It's, yep. And so you have that fear there and then it gets reinforced by parents wanting you to take the safe route through life and just kind of steers you away from some of these, these things. Like I mentioned before, like, you know, I thought that I was, you know, a mentor. yeah, a mentor, like this person seems really cool. They're interested in helping me and find out their motivations are different. And it's really hurtful. Scary. I mean, yeah. It's scary, it's hurtful, and you very quickly can become lost in the sense of what did, I, I mean, as a victim, you, you blame yourself for the action of others. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the emotional awareness or the, the mental capacity to realize that it's not your fault, it just, I, it can become agony for, for people and, and but that, that, is something, that, that is something that also is, comes in from outside because you know so often uh, it's we we are more aware of it now but this victim blaming oh she was in the wrong it's part of town she was wearing the wrong what 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 does that even my mean clothes, what you yeah, in the my, wrong my clothes. clothes how do you wear the wrong clothes mm -hmm. how does you don't well, how does one get from oh she was attacked she was to like, oh she shouldn't be wearing those clothes how, how, for it. yeah it's just it's just nuts getting back to the tech thing uh, i did hear an interesting story about uh, interesting story not uh, interesting kind of theory of of why uh, a lot of kids for example in the 80s uh, uh why there was this this mega thing about boys getting into tech in the in the 80s what happened apparently was the original uh, uh, game consoles were designed for the whole family. So they were just, you know, there was your Pong, there was your tennis, there was a blah, 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 and then later on, things like Space Invaders, and they were not gender specific. But there was a point where they were becoming very popular, and it was starting to stock them in, in uh, 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 shops, in, in stores, right? Uh, I mean, your Walmarts or your Targets or whatever existed at the time. And then uh, they had to make a decision because there were there were the the pink shelves where all the Barbies were and all the little babies were and all the little plastic babies and stuff like that were and there were the blue shelves with the action men and the and Trans and unfortunately the Legos and the soldiers da, da, da. they had to put them on one of the two shelves there was nothing in the middle mm -hmm. and they just said we'll put them here and they put them on the blue shelves and so then in in the mind of the consumer uh, this is, i i don't know how how true this theory is i read it some time ago in the mind of the consumer they started associating uh video games and video consoles with boy stuff hmm. interesting i mean yeah you look back at the old atari ads they were the entire family playing together and then fast forward game boy comes out you know i game boy yeah Boy, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was even at a super young age like that. I was super uncomfortable with the name they chose, but that's a transition of what, 10 years or so. Like, you know, there must have been a specific reason they chose boy in uh, naming it. Yeah, you, well, that might be true. That is, that is a theory that I read, yeah. So it was, it was uh, uh, kind of just maybe just a chance decision a very unfortunate chance decision but you know yeah you know i have a 
I have a product that I worked on. Um, it was a, a toy designed for girls. It was pretty, you know, personally, it was pretty wretched, the content that was going on to it. I was advocating, it was a computing device. And um, like, yeah, we could put logo in this or something equivalent to logo or basic and have the ability for, you know, this compute device for girls to do some serious compute stuff. And it was rejected. And that was a big disappointment for me. Product sold like crazy, right? Because it was sold as a, an educational device, but you know, I felt like I lost. You know, I just couldn't advocate enough to get real sciencey things integrated into it, and that's that's just that was a I think, you know, a mental, you know, uh, block that the executives at this company who I didn't well, see any women um, in this particular company. All right. Okay, uh, uh, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm looking at my time here. It's like oh, I gotta go. Yeah, yeah. We all oh, gotta no. go. This has been so delightful, guys. Thank you for. Uh... Yeah. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for your time. It's so fascinating as usual. Well, thank you. It's been super fun. Bye. Right. Bye. See you later.